We are going to learn today about the different principles of gemology and also how gemstones and minerals take part in South Asian uh, art and art history. Okay? So the first thing to learn is how to identify or look at a gemstone. I mean, with connoisseurship, identification, quality, gemstones is a micro world, a teeny little world that you'd be able to look inside that gem and see a whole other place. Inclusions, the type of cracks are there, also color, what is its shape, and also to identify the mineral, okay? So first thing I'm gonna do is teach you how to use a loop, okay? <clears throat> now a loop is not a magnifying glass. A magnifying glass just makes an object larger. A loop actually will match the uh, convex of your eye and therefore is just helping your eye make that object larger, okay? So you do like this with your hand, okay? Just kind of make that little bridge for your thumb and then bring that so you have this much space between your eye and the object, okay? And then I'm gonna take the gemstone here <clears throat> and then you don't move this, this is stationary. Mm -hmm. And also, incorrectly, don't close your eye like you're gonna focus better. It's not true, you don't look in the distance and close your eye and say, wow, I can see better. No, you keep them both open, both eyes open, okay? Then you bring the gemstone directly into the loop until you can see clearly inside. Now, a complication is the polish and the exterior and what you're seeing inside the gem is not the same, okay? So you want to be able to identify the outside and the inside, and it will take practice, okay? But we're gonna try, okay? Thank you. <clears throat> a little bit like this. Bring that up to your face. Okay, until you can see directly into it. Yeah. Now take the gemstone in this hand and bring that up until you can see it in focus. Don't close your eyes. Yeah. Can you see it clearly? Yes. Okay, can you see the difference between the polish, the exterior, and what's inside the gem, or is it kind of the same to you at the moment? Still trying to focus. I do see bits of it, but no, it's gone out of focus again. Okay. Keep it inside the lens, and then just move it until it's completely clear. Yeah. Is it clear now? Yeah, I can see the cuts of the gem, and I can see. And the cuts it. are called facets. Facets. So I see the facets of the gem. Yes. And I can see um, a lot of clear. It's really clear. It's well, it's really clear because it's high quality. Okay. So 60% of the value of a gemstone is its color. 30% is its clarity, how clear is the gem. And 10% of the value is its cut. Now that cut may be only 10% of the value, but its resaleability has a lot to do with it. For, for example, here in South Asia, traditionally gemstone cutting was about the most beautiful gemstones. You'd want the best color, you'd want the best clarity, and you want a liquefied look. The European thought process with cutting is symmetry. So they'd often sacrifice color, yes, for symmetry. Another thing is a cabochon. So this is a cabochon, a very rare gem found in India. It's a rainbow moonstone, and you can see that lots and lots of different color. You can see there's purple, you can see there's blue, green. So that's known as a rainbow moonstone. This deposit um, is part of the feldspar family and only found in Tamil Nadu in the world. <clears throat> so this cut is a cabochon, which is French for this, this smooth cut. Traditionally in South Asia, beads and cabochons always made in very high quality material. The European thought, the Western thought, is lower quality material is used for this cut, cabochon just for the color, but not in this part of the world, okay? So back to the loop. Um, you're not taking any notes on anything we're saying, so you should do that. Okay, ready? Okay, now bring that directly up to your, there. Can you see right into it? Okay, keep this eye open. Now I'm gonna put the gemstone in your hand. Here you go. Just let me have control. There you go. Now you're going to bring this completely up to the lens until it's in focus. 
Can you see it in focus or not? Yes, I can see it. Okay, can you see the difference between the outside polish and the inside polish? Yes. Okay, what else do you see? You can see the clear hand spot. It's okay. more... It's what? No, keep both eyes open. It's clear from the inside. Yes, to the eye. So this is known as eye clean. So when you have a high quality gemstone that is perceptible uh, to be clear, it's called eye clean. All gemology is based on 10 magnification. So you magnify with this loop at 10 times and that's how you grade the quality of the clarity. Also, the inclusions inside, which you don't have the experience yet to see those cracks, will also identify where the gemstone is. Every gemstone deposit in the world is just like a fingerprint. So you might have a sapphire found in Kashmir, a sapphire found in Burma. They're both sapphire. They're the Corindum family. But the inclusions from that origin, that deposit, how they were formed, and that chemistry is a little different. So the inclusions inside is just like a human fingerprint. It will identify where it came from. So step by step, yes, it takes lots of time. And then you can learn that through the loop as well. Would you like to try? <coughs> Put your finger inside. Yeah. Yes, cup your thumb. Yeah, bring it to your eye. Now, you want to look directly into it. Keep it straight. Directly look into it. Are you looking into it? Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm going to put the gemstone in your hand. So you have to grip the gem. Bring the gemstone until it's completely in focus. Don't move this hand. Can you see inside it now? Mm -hmm. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. Fully clear? Yes. Okay, what do you see? <clears throat> there, there are some sort of bubbles inside. Okay. You can see a small, small bubble inside the gem. But are they actually round or are they linear that's put together in a circle? Um, I don't think it's round. That's correct. Because anything that's fully round, if it was a bubble, it would mean it's a synthetic made in a laboratory, not a natural gemstone. Nature never makes things in circles. It always builds by straight lines. So you can have something that's perceived to be in a circle. It's actually straight lines coming okay. together. Can you see the difference? Yes. Okay, so this gemstone is tourmaline. It's from the Singhalese word tourmali for many colors because it comes in every color of the rainbow. And this one was mined in Nuristan in Afghanistan. How would you define this color? What I would define this color as a grayish pink. And how would you define this color without terminology? Um, a little bit brown. There's a, yeah, there's a little brown in it. Mm -hmm. And very light magenta. I wouldn't say magenta. Magenta is more toward the red or purple. So it's, it's, it's lighter shade. Very halka, light shade, more pink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this one is a rainbow moonstone. And it's cabochon cut. It's in cabochon cut. This one is faceted. And this is in a scissor emerald cut. Scissor emerald. Yeah, so with tourmaline, interestingly, if you look through the tourmaline like this, look at that. You see how much darker it is this way? And here it is lighter. Okay, and mm -hmm. here it's a different color. The reason of that is tourmaline is double refractive. So all gemstones either split light once or twice. So what that means is single refractive, one light ray will come into the material and one light ray will exit. Double refractive means one light ray will come in and two light rays will exit. Now with tourmaline in its growth structure along the C axis, which is that top axis of the mineral, it's a much slower speed of light for that double refraction. So it's much darker. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. So on the optimum axis here, y-axis here, 
it's much lighter. So this cut often, emerald cut or squares or more triangle, uh, rectangles, triangles are done to stop the light on the one side so that the dark color does not take over. Sometimes the optum axis is very light color and the c-axis is a darker color but beautiful. What's the c-axis? C-axis is this way along the tourmaline crystal. And then you cut the top of the gemstone, which is known as the table here, from the top. So just for identification of this cut, the top of the gemstone, if this top is known as a table facet. Then you have the crown facets, you have the girdle, you have the pavilion, and the last point, the small polish here at the bottom, is known as the collet. Okay? So table, crown, girdle, pavilion, collet. Did you get that? So that's how you identify the different parts of a faceted gem. Now with the cabochon, you don't have that. But you do with faceted gems, the terminology. Okay? So this is single refractive? No, it's, it's double, double refractive. refractive. And this? Well, what do you think? <clears throat> I'll show you a little trick. May I have your paper? Mm -hmm. Now, you have to pay really close attention. You have to bring your heads forward. Okay, and I'm going to just turn this. I want you to look right in the center of the gem. Okay, and when I slowly turn it, do you see the shade alter? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like a blinking, like somebody blinking at you or winking at you. Do mm -hmm. you see that? Yes. 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 So, it's a very simple field test to know is that material double or single refractive? It's double refractive. If it blinks. If it blinks. Okay. Okay. So we'll take this cabochon and we're going to do the same thing. There's not blink. Okay, but wait. It oh, blinks all right. Yeah. It blinks very well. Uh -huh. And okay. it's got like the tinge of green in it. It does green, purple, blue. It's hard on the white, but when it's set into jewelry, and it's just at the background, but here you can see that incredible colors. Yes. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. So this is also mm -hmm. a double refractive? Yes, it is, double refractive. Yeah. Okay? It's a moonstone? Well, theoretically, it's a Labradorite, but moonstone, Labradorite, um, they are part of the Feldspar family. So just like you have your sisters, your brothers, you're all part of the same family, but you are genetically different. Now, precious gemstones in South Asia have also had other uses in history, um, ex uh, besides wearing them as, as jewelry or jewels, okay? So one of them is the use as a paint pigment. So traditionally in South Asian miniatures, <coughs> I'll show you a finished miniature here. So here's a miniature. And in this miniature, you can see this beautiful, I've got a furosa blue. You see this darker blue at the top. Here's this intense blues, the greens, the peach, the skin tones. See all those colors? All of these on a traditional painting, like this one from our Kargana, is made and produced with real gemstones. Now, this art completely died. So one of the things we revived fully was high quality gemstone pigments. Today now they're using what's called stabilized minerals. So you have powdered crushed gems when you're cutting and you, you use pressure to, to get that to be solidified again, which is not really a gemstone. Or they're using synthetic colors and then they're painting directly. The other thing they're doing is traditionally in South Asia, you would have a single sheet of handmade paper is known as warka. And many layers of handmade paper is known as wasli. Okay. Can you spell it? Uh, yes. In English, be W A R Q A. And wasli would be W A S L I. Again, in tradition of South Asian miniatures, which originally came out of Afghanistan, Herat, the Persian world. And there was also local indigenous Indian schools, the Western School of Gujarat, for example. There were influences coming from China via Persia into India, and then later European traditions coming into South Asian painting as well. So 
keeping within the tradition of a miniature in South Asia, natural color pigments were always used. So they're real gemstones, ground down and made into colors. You can also see that gold was made into paint as well. You can see the gold. So this darker blue that you see here was produced uh, from Lajwar in Hindi or lapis lazuli um, in most of the Western world. So this tradition had completely died. So we revived also producing real pigments again uh, for painting or also can be used for mineral makeup. But we did it for, for conservation and also to produce artworks like this again. So I'll show you what that uh, looks like. So this is pure ground lapis lazuli. So you take the highest quality of lapis lazuli, and just to give you an idea, that can be many lex price per kilo. So you're taking something that's a gemstone already in its own right, high quality, and you have to take out the impurities. First you have to extract pyrite, the calcite, and you're left with just uh, the lajoir, the, the lazulite part of the mineral. And then you grind it down to a 300 mesh by hand, to make it finer than, than dust, yes? So you've taken this incredible precious material and you've made it into powder. Now, if you're gonna make a pigment out of this, excuse me, I'm just gonna grab this. So traditionally, there are different parts you would use, but I will do it uh, as a demonstration to here a little quicker. So this is a natural gund, gum arabic. Two parts of the world produce the best quality gum arabic you have here in Western India, and you also have in East Africa. So this is our own Desi Gund, and we're just gonna put it there. I'm going to get just a little bit of water. And we're just going to put water onto the goon. And we're going to rub this goon just a little bit into this. I'm gonna use my finger, it's gonna be faster. Okay. You can just feel that a little bit with your finger and you can see it's a little sticky, tacky. Yeah. Okay, so that helps also the pigment bind. Another material is sedesh, which was uh, made from freshwater uh, fish intestines. Very rarely still used today, uh, but it's a great binding agent. So, now that water is, even though we can't see it, it's now mixed with the goo and a little bit sticky. So I'm just gonna take a pinch of this lajoir and I'm gonna put it here. And you're going to see magic happen, because it is magic. <laughs> and we're going to just move that. I don't know. You can. You can just play in it. You can just put your fingers in play. You can just go like that. Okay, mix that. See that? And you will see that that is how you're producing this color in a miniature. Okay? Now, for example, you want to make a monsoon, because it's now monsoon. So you want to make a monsoon sky. So this is black tourmaline, known as shoral. So let's just take a teeny, teeny touch of that and throw it in. Black tourmaline. 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 Yes. It's known as what? Shoral, S-C-H-O-R-L, is black tourmaline. And we're going to mix that again. Oh. And now all of a sudden you have monsoon sky. And it's the same sort of color I've seen in the, the peacock in the desert, the cosmos. Yes. In, in um, Mahindra, yeah. yes. It is this. Amazing. Often, many things, even institutions today, are misidentified. Like they'll say it's indigo in a color. Mm. Often, you know, just things, expertise on color, it's complicated. So, yes, so now you have a monsoon sky. Okay? So, the, your different colors in your uh, miniature school of art for Bikaner that you've done, uh, that has all of these colors mm -hmm. in it, and what is the basic idea behind these colors? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite get the question. Your book that you've written on the Week Under School of Miniature Art yeah. explains certain colors and yes. how they, they how, what they look like once they are done. Yes. And, but, so, 
is this what you're telling us and what is in the book is same or just or just similar? No, it is the same. There's different editions, for example, one of the rarest colors in South Asian art is known as Gaogoli. And Gaogoli was by taking mango leaf and having cows eat the mango leaf. You would then collect the urine from the cow and then you would take gypsum, yes, and a couple other process, it's a mineral. You would soak that inside the cow urine and you get an intense yellow. And so that color is very famous from South Asia, known as Gaogoli. So you can have organics, you can have non-organics as well. So non-organics are like this minerals, but here's goon, which is an organic, and we are combining this art and science together to produce the colors. Today in miniature painting in India, almost never are real gemstones used anymore. Um, also, like I was saying earlier, WASLI is a single sheet of handmade paper, and what's many layers? Well, WASLI is, uh, WASLI WASLI is double. Is Many layers. Many, Many layers. layers. And right. oh, well done. Mm -hmm. So this is, so this here we've got, so that's already beginning of a wasli. So that's a few layers of worka to get a wasli. But this one's not finished yet, so there's more layers to get wasli. And in South Asia, the canvas, or what's painted on, is always on paper. And they are watercolors. The European tradition of watercolors is very different than the South Asian one. They don't look anything alike. Because they of the use. use the worka or the wasli? They use both. So worka can be a uh, painted drawing, which is known as a siya kalam in South Asia, coming out of siya, yeah, which is for that lamp black, and kalam, which means brush. Today, people identify in South Asia that kalam is what you're using now to write with, but traditionally a kalam is a brush. So siya kalam. Looks like a drawing. In the, in the West or Europe, they would be using a drawing um, from... Um, India ink and different things they, they would use for drawings. Uh, but here it was always a brush. And that was usually done on a work, a single sheet. Now that would be done for some collectors or for royals or aristocrats that would patron for drawings. But usually for uh, different artisans in the different karkanas, the workshops, for their own pleasure and to perfect their uh, art. Interestingly, in South Asian painting, the first line that's painted, yes, is known as a siyahi line, yes? is known as the Siyahi line, and that is the test of a master. Unlike the European tradition of painting, in South Asia, if you're holding a brush, I'm going to borrow somebody's pen, I'm going to uh, make it look like I'm holding a brush. So a European artist cannot take their hand, they're painting like this, but in South Asia, as all of us growing up in this part of the world, we know that we can take our hand and fully go around in one continual circle, like this. And very important with painting that you do not lift your hand for that first line. So if you are going to draw something, yes, it gives you great immense control. So for example, if I'm just going to say, uh, let's say, Vedika's name, and I'm going to do it even by just writing, I can have immense control wow. over my hand to produce beauty by using that tradition, even if I'm writing in English. Yes. So it's the same thing with using a brush as that South Asian tradition. That's known as the Siyahi line. Siyahi. So within Karkanas, the master artisans, each generation were tested by how well they did the Siyahi line. Once you have an opaque watercolor like this with all the colors in it already, if you have a mistake, you can correct it. But a Siya kalam, a painted drawing, a Siyahi line, you can't correct it. If I go like this, you're going to see it's a problem. Yes, so that's why it was tested in the Karkanas between masters and royal patrons and aristocrats to say that man is a master because he has mastered the Siyahi line. Okay, so poetry in motion. Okay. Another use of precious gemstones in South Asian um, art objects, mediums, uh, is the tradition known as Panchkari. In the Western world, it has the Italian uh, terminology, which is known as pietra dura. And it's a combination of both the Persian tradition and the European tradition became Panchkari. For example, one of the most famous buildings here in India is the Taj Mahal. And that is with Panchkari that has been um, inlaid into Makrana white marble. The reason Makana marble was used is because it's acid-resistant, high quality. So that is for architectural elements. 
The art of panchkari properly miniaturized for art objects has almost disappeared. There's a lot of it being produced in different parts of, let's say, Agra and, and this area, areas of Uttar Pradesh, but not following the actual tradition of panchkari. So this plate here is a masterpiece. It took about one year to make. And that is taking the different gemstones, even our pigments, making these tiny little pieces, and then we are engraving the Makarana marble, and then we are inlaying the precious gemstones into the object. So the same gem that we, we ground down here, the Lajoir, yes, is this intense blue that's here. The lighter blue is the Feroza, or in English, turquoise. And the reason it's called turquoise in English is because it used to go through Turkey to the Western world, and so it got the name turquoise. Uh, you have jasper, which is from central India, which is the best quality uh, in Asia. And you also have different shell for freshwater uh, mollusks. That's the kind of luminescent one, the opal, opalescent looking colors. And the green? Uh, the green is malachite, and that is not Indian in origin. The best malachite in the world is from Uzbekistan. Even though Zaire in Africa produces a lot of it, my opinion the best is, is central Asia. Uh, so most of the panchkari you're seeing now done for tourism, it's not a very high level art, it's very flat, it's non-fluid, and as you can see with this piece, there's all this life and, and mobility in it, yeah? So another use of precious gems uh, in decorative art in South Asia or fine art. Panchkari. Panchkari, yes. Another traditional uh, medium in South Asia is lock. So does anybody know what lock is produced from? Yes. What, what is lock? Um, lock is uh, the excreta of one lac insects, specifically found on um, Buteomonosperma, this flame of the forest. Or plash tree. Or plash tree. In Hindi. Yes. There is a method of extracting that. Mm -hmm. Lock, it means one lock. It does. So, yes, yeah, so it's the excretion of the lock insect. So this insect is the lock insect. They prefer the plash tree. Uh, sorry, the Latin, you know. Beauty of Monosma. Perfect. And you collect that excretion. And they love this tree. And they also don't damage this tree. An amazing thing about this tree as well is it's a natural insecticide. Mosquitoes are attracted to it and the mosquitoes die. It's one of the reasons when, uh, before the British had come to South Asia, there was very little malaria in South Asia because these forests were everywhere. And also lock was quite prevalent. Uh, a lot of those trees were cut down. Today, um, Bihar, Jharkhand side produces most of the high quality lock in India. It goes to Kolkata. And then from Kolkata, it goes to the rest of the country after it's processed into its raw form. Most people are used to seeing lock in this kind of very, uh, opaque brown type of material. When you're processing lock, the high quality material can take six months to produce. And it's much finer uh, material, but it's very, very slow process. And that's what we use in our mediums. We revive natural vegetable and mineral colors into our lock as well. And so this is lock with different colors. So we were speaking about pigments in um, miniature paintings and also for um, um, other usage. So this is the black tourmaline that we used to make a monsoon sky earlier. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the black tourmaline. And so you take this powder and you would get your lock, high quality lock, after six months of processing it. You have two wood sticks. You heat the lock and then you start to move this like a taffy or, or like making a sweet or something or wax or something. And then you are kneading this color. You bring this color into it, the black tourmaline. You keep going, you keep going, you keep going until that color permeates into the lock. So that's a natural colored lock, okay? Most of the lock today is, again, a synthetic um, coloring going into it, or is a very low quality. Um, now, there's a saying in English that it's as hard as lock, or hard as lacquer, because in English, lock became lacquer. From South Asia, it went to Southeast Asia, then to East Asia, and the rest of the world. But real lacquer is now rare. And so even a simple thing like a, a lock bangle that people wear today, things like, oh, it's, you know, it's nothing, it's just a lock bangle. Here we are in a country that is one of the last in the world that produces things of lock. So different traditions of lock and those natural mineral colors and vegetable colors in the lock. Um, this is a kalankari, so this is a masterpiece, again, about um, eight to nine months to make. So that is completely hand engraved. 
Yes, and with this hand engraving, and then you're taking the natural colored uh, lock, lock, and you're inlaying it into it. So the look is a little bit like Nina Kari or an English enamel, uh, but much far uh, finer and more difficult to produce because Minakari is ground colored glass where this is a resinous natural material and you have to be able to inlay it into your pattern without making it a mess. Yes, and so you can see exquisite detail of engraving and carving and all of our objects as we were saying before each master will sign it so this workshop's master signature is there and of course in the South Asian tradition uh, the patron myself, or, or um, as I call second-tier patrons, our clientele, our collectors. Uh, they also are very important for the aesthetic, the quality control, and the collecting. Where in the Western world, it was usually about the artists themselves. Here, it was necessary for that patron to direct for quality control. So this I designed. I also oversee its quality control. Though the artisans himself, this master, produced the work. Yeah. How now, long does it take to color the lacquer? Uh, it depends on the type of material, yes, um, but let's say within 30 minutes you can usually get like um, double the size of this maybe, you can usually get to be okay in a color. And you want to get it consistent so you can see the solidness of the color, so you can see how that's very consistent, looks like wax. So taking this powder, putting it into a lock, getting it to come permanently into one color, making an art object like this to hand engrave it, and then inlay that into this. So most people are looking at these top quality art objects and thinking, wow, it's a beautiful bowl. Yes, imagine the immense talent, knowledge, taste, yes, to be able to create this object. Yeah. So also use things like this with bangles traditionally. These are solid silver. And then this engraving, you can see this is also very fine. Here you've got really detailed smaller engraving and borders. The same thing onto the bangles like this. And then inlaying the lock into those patterns. Yes, and also lock on the inside of the bangles as well. So that looks like it's very simple, but again you have to engrave all that silver out. You have to hand chisel this by hand, and then you have to inlay that lacquer into it. So imagine Something again that resonance, that move, you know, that type of malleability or movement, and getting it to be so precise and perfect. Looks like it's something very simple, but very, very difficult. Yeah. Is this the same color of this bangle? It is. Well done. Correct. <clears throat> so, what does lock originally look like? Then, what's the color? Um, the color is kind of a mixture between like a, a lighter straw color mm -hmm. formation to a, to a medium to darker brown. And usually kind of a modelmation of those shades. When you are producing and you're getting the high quality, like I said, to get that best quality, it takes about six months. Then it's almost like a light, uh, kind of like a light yellow or light, um, kind of a light whiskey. The lower quality is the really dark resinous material, which you more commonly see everywhere. But lock has an incredible amount of applications. I mean, it's used everywhere. Even in jewelry, traditionally, you'd have really fine gold, yes, and then you would have the lock inside the jewelry. This table is 24 karat gold. It's in the Manuti Nakashi medium, so that's solid gold, and it's on sub one. And also, lock is used to bind this material, Manut, which is meaning the sand from basically marwar, um, to get that to solidify, that's also, that's also lock inside that. 